M3 TV is proud to present Locker Room Talk. Today's guest, Mark Monteith. Well, hi, everyone. It's Matt Clare, and uh, welcome to the Locker Room. And uh, this is our second installment. Gus Gerard was on our first show, and if you missed that, you want to check it out, okay? Uh, on uh, either M3 TV, Dot com, or you could go right to the streaming network on Roku TV. All right, so my guest today is none other than Mark Monteith. And for those of you who are not familiar with Mr. Monteith, he was, well, he, he'll be modest about it, but he was instrumental in putting together something for the old ABA players uh, who didn't get paid any kind of, of uh What's the word I'm looking for, Mark? Help me out here. They didn't get any pension benefits. Yeah, <laughs> technically not a pension, but retirement benefits, I guess you'd say. Retirement benefits, right. And uh, those of you who are old basketball heads understand uh, how much we all love the ABA and we all wish for these guys to uh, give us so much so much to, you know, to enjoy back in their heyday. Well, now it's an opportunity for them to get a little something. So, um, Mark, welcome to the show. Uh, the first thing I want to ask you, and I mentioned your modesty because I've done some research, <laughs> and I know that uh, you were quick to, you know, rightfully so, give Scott Tarter a lot of credit. Um, I believe he was the one who initiated this. Yeah, uh, Scott is really the guy who gets the vast majority of the credit for the ABA players getting recognized here, but. He, um, he's a pretty good story. I've written about him. He grew up in Indianapolis, was a Pacers fan. He only attended one game, personally. Uh, as a kid, his dad worked at a Ford factory. They didn't have the money to go to a lot of games. He went to one game, but he listened on the radio, watched games on television when they happened to be on television, and uh, was a huge fan, became an attorney in later years, so happened he met Mel Daniels and some of the other former Pacers who were here in town, and they started telling him about how some of the former ABA players were kind of struggling, you know, needed some help. So they started a foundation called Dropping Dimes, which is, I think is a clever name because Dropping Dimes, you know, we know is an assist. And um, out of that grew the effort to get some kind of benefits for the former ABA players. And People need to understand, Scott did this for no personal gain whatsoever. He um, did a pro bono, as you would say, as an attorney. He took no money whatsoever. In fact, he told me that if he had taken a fee, it probably would not have been done. The NBA would not have uh, worked with him on it because they would have felt he was just there to get paid himself. So the fact he was doing this and not taking anything for it personally uh, is really what persuaded the NBA to work with him on it. And I, I have a feeling that uh, never having met the man, never having spoken to him, I have this funny feeling that if I were to talk to him, and maybe I'll get that chance, mm -hmm. but uh, I have this feeling that he would pass the credit along to a few other people too. I, I did read an article uh, that you had written about uh, Mr. Harder, I, Tarter, I'm sorry, um, mm -hmm. in, in your newspaper, uh, Indiana Business Journal. Indianapolis Business Journal. Indianapolis Business Journal. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And so I did read that. Uh, it's it's a good read, folks. I forget the, the date. I should have I should have uh, jotted it down. But uh, if you get a chance, go to uh, Indiana Indianapolis Business Journal. Go to the website, and I guess they could just put in your name. Really, they could do it on Google, folks. Go to Google if you don't know the web address, and I'm not really sure of it. Just go to Google. Put in uh, Indianapolis Business Journal, and uh, uh, you'll be able to find the article. Yeah, the website is ibj.com. IBJ, okay. Yeah. All right, ibj.gov. Com, dot com. com. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, so, so let's talk about the benefit uh, for these players. There's about, I understand about 115 that would be uh, eligible. Mm-hmm. And so now how are they going to get paid? I think they will get paid. I talked with the representative of the NBA and am told that they will get paid in one annual lump sum. And it looks like they 
sometime before the end of the year, maybe October, November, they'll get paid for 2022, whatever they're owed. And then they'll get another check early 2023. And from then on, the ones who are eligible will get one annual payment every year. Certainly it's understandable that these things take time to develop. You know, if, if I remember correctly, it started with just a, 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 a passing comment. I'm not quite sure I remember whether it was you or whether it was somebody else, uh, but I know there was some passing comment about, we need to do something for these guys. It's a shame that, you know, uh, uh, could you give, give us a background on that? Yeah, yeah, I'd say around 2013, 14, when Scott Tarter met some of these former Pacers, Mel Daniels, there's another man, John Abrams, who's the Pacers team ophthalmologist. He was a Pacers ball boy as a kid. His dad was the Pacers original eye doctor. Then John took it oh. over. And he's still a practicing ophthalmologist and um, is the Pacers team doctor. And, uh, you know, so he was aware of a lot of these things. And Scott and John kind of teamed up. And as they heard more and more about the needs of some of the former ABA players, started the foundation and they were raising money and gosh, they, they did some great things. You know, they um, paid for a tombstone, you know, for George Carter. They, they paid for medical care for certain players. They bought wheelchairs, they bought walkers, you know, for players, that type of thing. So, and again, neither one of them had their hand out and wanted anything personally from it. They bought Slick Leonard, a really nice walker in his later years, uh, the former Pacers coach. So, um, they really didn't start the effort to get retirement benefits, or I guess the technical term would be recognition benefits, uh, right. until just a couple of years ago. And I know one thing people say is this should have happened a long time ago. Well, the NBA wasn't asked to do this until just a couple of years ago, maybe 18 months ago. Um, and the NBA paid almost what they were asked to pay, They're not quite as much, but almost what they were asked to pay. So I've gotten a little bit defensive about people who are uh, really ripping the NBA for not doing more or not doing it earlier because the NBA wasn't asked to do it earlier, uh, very much earlier. It did take a while and Scott got frustrated. Uh, you know, this kind of thing isn't gonna happen overnight, but it did finally happen. It's a shame it wasn't sooner, but uh, again, the effort wasn't made until recently People need to understand that the ABA had a players union and they had a pension plan. Players were paying union dues into an ABA pension. And in 1976, when the leagues called a merger or whatever you want to call it, four teams went into the NBA, the San Antonio Spurs were assigned the task of uh, governing, managing the ABA pension. But they didn't really do it. This kind of got pushed aside and the guys were – it wasn't being uh, – monitored and money wasn't being invested in that kind of thing. So in the early 80s, word got out to a lot of players that, hey, this thing may go away. You may want to take a lump sum right now. So guys took, I know locally, you know, Billy Keller played seven years in the NBA. He took about $35,000 in the early 80s. And Rick Mount played five years in the ABA. He, he, took, he, he you know, gets like, about 11 something, doesn't he? Well, he's going to, in this plan, the current one, he is going to. But I'm talking about in the early 80s, these ABA guys got a retirement benefit then out of the ABA pension. Right. Okay. But not everybody got it. it. It just kind of got, you know, the word, the communication wasn't good. Some players took money, some didn't. So in 2014, Matt Calvin, like a five time ABA All Star, uh, he sued the San Antonio Spurs. And you could Google Matt Calvin versus San Antonio Spurs. And a lawsuit was filed in 2014, and, and Mac won uh, a $1.2 million settlement. One third of that went to attorney fees. The yep. Distributed. <laughs> you know, Mac That's standard. Made, in, in that deal in 2014, some, a few, it seemed like a few guys got quite a bit of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, but most guys got like $4,900. But again, wow. it, it just wasn't properly administered. So, ABA guys had been paid, a lot of them, but this wasn't managed well and communication wasn't good. And some guys said they didn't get anything. And that's what led to this latest effort uh, to get everybody who had played three seasons or more paid. And uh, so I think you could say that this 
in a sense, is a gift from the NBA because Billy Keller, for example, played seven years in the ABA. He didn't do anything to help the NBA. He didn't play in the NBA. He didn't put he didn't pay union dues to the NBA Players Association or anything like that. Uh, you know, none of these guys did. So it really is kind of a gift on the part of the NBA, and it's nice of them. Uh, and again, I give all the credit or most of the credit to Scott Carter and a few others who really pushed this thing through. This is why the NBA calls it a recognition benefit. And Netalicki described it well when I talked with him. It's really acknowledging the contributions of the ABA to basketball. It's acknowledging that the ABA was a, an important part of the basketball world back in the 70s. Um, and the players are getting rewarded for that. Uh, you know, the ABA is, as, as you know, popularized the three-point shot, the red, white, and blue. People love that. And um, so that's what the NBA is doing here, really. And uh, it's not a case of where the NBA is being greedy, uh, that type of thing. You know, I, I sometimes laugh. People will say, LeBron James is getting $40 million a year. Why can't the NBA do this? You know, Le LeBron James's salary has nothing to do with the ABA. So, yeah. you know, so it, yeah. it, it gets complicated, but I think the NBA is doing a wonderful thing here. Okay. And, and that's, that's a sign. Uh, I would say that a lot of people might not be aware of, because yeah. I'll be honest with you. My thought, while I didn't look at LeBron James salary, <laughs> uh, you know, my initial thought has always been, well, you know, the NBA makes so much money. I mean, you know, you've got butts in the seats and, you know, they, I mean, you can't even, if you're, if you're a father too, you can't take them to the game with you. All right. So you got butts in the seats though. All right. Mm -hmm. And aside from butts in the seats, you get all this TV revenue from multiple national contracts. Yeah. Along with local contracts, local TV contracts and radio contracts. So I'm looking at it just like a lot of other people, you know, but I understand what you're saying. Uh, I will say this. Now, I read that um, uh, the, the announcement, the, the official announcement on NBA letterhead. By the way. Right. Uh, and they call it the recognition payments for former ABA players. Mm -hmm. I was kind of uh, intrigued by a quote from the executive director, Tamika Tremaglio, I think I'm saying her right, her, her name right. Uh, we have always considered the ABA players a part of our brotherhood, and we are proud to finally recognize them with this benefit. Yeah. And that's nice, but there are those, you know, just kind of circling back a little bit, there are those who can say, why did it take so long? Right. You know? Well, um, the answer to that is that they weren't asked to do anything see when that when that lawsuit was filed in 2014 and the players won and money got distributed most people in the nba thought that it was handled that the aba pension was finally settled in 2014 i know when john abrams the pacers ophthalmologist went to um uh herb simon the pacers owner to say can you help us with this will you support us on this herb simon's response was said, i thought yes. that's he said, we said yes, but he, first he said, I thought that was already settled, you know, years ago, you know, because again, in 2014, there was that lawsuit, the players won and money was distributed. But again, some guys said, I never got money. And the other guys got, you know, four to $5,000, you know, a one-time payment. That's nothing. So uh, the thought really among the NBA was that that ABA pension thing was settled in 2014. So they had to be brought up to date on what really came down off of that. And there are some things, again, some players I think got a lot of money out of that lawsuit and most uh, didn't get much of anything. And there were some hard feelings about that, you know, so this kind of clears the decks. Everybody who is eligible for a pension having played three years, you know, at least half of a season in three years, uh, will get some sort of pension. Okay, fair enough. Fair okay, enough. An annual payment, I should say, really. Yeah, I understood. And then I think, as you said, uh, this has been uh, titled appropriately enough recognition pay payments. Mm -hmm. And that, that's fair. Um, so I'm going to ask you about a couple of other things now. Since it, you're a basketball guy, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you know, you're a writer, and I know that you've probably heard a lot of things over the years. 
So uh, let's go back now to uh, 76. Okay. So mm -hmm. the end of the season, you know, the Nets are the champs. And I asked this of Gus Gerard. Um, now, certainly there were ripples in the water that this was a done deal. Did you hear that? I mean, even before the season ended? Done deal, you mean that the ABA was folding? The or was that I'm sorry? The merger. A merger. Uh, no, it wasn't a done deal when that season ended. I think most people thought the ABA is just going to die here. You know, the two teams dropped out of the league early that last season, that 75, 76 season. The Squires were one, right? Yeah. And, yeah, Baltimore, and yeah, Baltimore, Baltimore Claws. <laughs> <laughs> the Memphis moved to Baltimore and the Claws folded. And so like there were seven teams, I think, that finished the year. The Pacers had a losing record that year and still made the playoffs. That's, you know, there were so few teams left. It was just, it was dying. And so the ABA did at least have some really good players that the NBA wanted. So the NBA set the parameters. Okay. You guys are dying here for $3.2 million. Uh, you can enter our league. And there were four teams that were able to do that, you know, as you well know. So the other three, like John Y. Brown took the money and uh, bought Buffalo and the St. Louis owner had got the best deal. I'm getting this John Y. Brown. <laughs> Yeah, not a popular man in Louisville. It's a smart man. No, I'm sure they love him. Yeah, yeah. So, so only four teams. Like, and the Pacers barely got in. You know, that $3.2 million. There aren't many guys in Indianapolis who had $3.2 million. Uh, and there was a guy named, the last name was Eason, E A S O N, who basically had the money. And on his own, he presented that check, and the Pacers got in. But they had to go without a draft pick and without TV revenue sharing and so forth. I mean, it was a battle just for survival uh, at that time. So, but when that last ABA season ended, everybody was what? Okay, now what? You know, I don't think anybody knew what was going to happen next. But what they did know was that there was not going to be another ABA season because it was dying. Now, that's funny because in Denver, and you know, again, talk with Gus Gerard. Yeah. Uh, and for those of you who don't know Gus Gerard, uh, he's a former ABA player. He started his career with the Spirits of St. Louis and mm -hmm. moved on to the Denver Nuggets. And uh, he was with them uh, in the final season of the ABA and played with the likes of David Thompson, who, you know, who took off for, for a minute in the NBA. Yeah. But, um, but Gus said that in Denver, they knew. And uh, I don't. I got the feeling because he never said that he knew because anyone verbalized this. Um, I think it was more of a feeling, okay. because as he said, they were already always playing with a full house. You know, a lot of people, you know, came to see them. Whereas some of the other teams, maybe they weren't so certain. You know, right. um, the the Nets, the, the Nets had to know, right? I mean, they got the best player in the league. They had to know. They had some security there, certainly, yeah, with Dr. J. I just remember I went back and read the local newspaper coverage of the Pacers that season at the end, and when they got eliminated in the playoffs in the first round, the tone of the article was, well, we'll just have to see what happens next. You know, there was no talk about getting into the NBA at that time. So it took a couple months before the, you know, the merger step really came into effect, and uh like I said, the patients barely got in, but I think when the season ended, it was like, okay, let's see what's going to happen here. We hope oh, something wow. does. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It was shaking. Unbelievable. And, you know, you, since you're, you're an Indiana guy and you're a Pacer guy, I would be remiss. And I know I'm going a little bit further back, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you your memories or your thoughts about uh, the marathon. The telethon. I'm telethon. Sorry. The telethon. Yeah. yeah, that was the summer I got out of college, and it's, <laughs> it's quite a thing. You know, the, uh, the that happened after the Pacers' first season in the NBA, and they drew pretty well because fans were excited about being in the NBA and seeing all these players they had never seen before coming in, you know, John Havlicek and different guys, Jabbar. And, um, uh, but still, at the end of that year, 
the Pacers just didn't have adequate ownership. They had an absentee owner, Sam Nassie, a guy out in California who is really a front man for Jerry Buss. Essentially, Jerry Buss owned two teams, the Lakers and the Pacers, and Sam Nassie was his front man. But they, they didn't have the money to really run a, an NBA franchise. And so they were told, basically, uh, Nancy Leonard, Slick Leonard's wife, is the assistant general manager running the front office. And she was told, like, you know, we need to have a guarantee of 8,000 season tickets next year or we're shutting the doors. And um, so they threw together in about 10 days uh, a telethon that they had downtown at the convention center. And somebody pointed this out to me not long ago. I never thought about it. It might have been illegal because you don't have telethons for businesses. You have telethons for charity, right? <laughs> no one's ever had a telethon for a business to you know, keep us alive, you know? But that's what they did. And Nancy Leonard threw that thing together. The whole city came together. The convention center donated their space. Three local television stations aired it um, almost. Wow. Uh, over, wow. It ran like 18 hours. It ran all through the night. You know, you could have turned on a TV at 3 a.m. and the telethon was going on. And it ran at funny. noon or one the next day. Um, Arby's, I think, donated food. Former players were manning the phones, taking calls, taking donations. Kids were oh, wow. piggy, 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 piggy banks. Little kids were going through the neighborhood collecting money and bringing in piggy banks. And they're counting coins on the floor of the convention center. I mean, it's incredible. It was really just an incredible thing. And, and they got it done. You know? it, was, it was a labor of love, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that, that was one of the things that, you know, having grown up in New York, I, I can tell you that, uh, you know, everybody loved the Nets, but, uh, you know, those who really followed the league, you know, the Cognoscentes, like yourself, uh, the aficionados, they knew the, the, the Pacers were, you know, they were the Celtics of the ABA, let's yeah. face it. Yeah. They were the Celtics of the ABA, you know, in terms of knowing how to take care of their ball players. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there was a family atmosphere always. I mean, and, uh, you know, everybody should have been trying to, you know, not reinvent the wheel, but just copy, copy the blueprint. You know? Yeah, yeah. The, pay, the paces were it. But um, the ABA was a wonderful league, gave us a lot of thrills. I, I, I you know, I think about, yeah, th this is a big thing. You know, going back to uh, this this analogy, it's a big victory. I can only think about a guy like Bert Averett, mm -hmm. uh, who might have been eligible. Yeah, he would um, you, you mentioned George Carter. I think about um, we, Goo Kennedy, who we just lost recently. Sam Smith. And, Sam else? Smith. Sam Smith. Sam was Smith. Another, another one. Yeah. 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 He allowed so Sam Smith I, allowed, I, let me add, Sam Smith is in the hospital dying, and he allowed Scott Tarter to take a photo of him in the bed to kind of promote the cause. Here's a guy who's got all these medical defenses. He could use some help. And so that probably helped push it over. I asked Scott once, what do you what got this done? What got it over the hump? And there was an article that was done a few years ago in USA Today about George Carter and uh, how ABA players are really struggling, some of them, and they don't have a pension, this kind of thing. Didn't really point out that it was kind of the ABA's own fault that it didn't get done. But uh, And then Bob Costas. Bob Costas deserves credit here because, you know, he was an announcer for the Yeah, Spirit I heard that he got involved. Yeah, he called the commission. He called Adam Silver, said, look, read that article in USA Today. And this did not happen. This should not be the case. The ABA did so much for basketball. And that really was a major element of this victory that they had. Uh, Costas was a great asset for this. Um, yeah, I, I did. In fact, I read it today. Uh, I had no idea that he was so instrumental. Yeah, he really was. No, yeah, so I, I, like I said, I did a little homework. In, um, and some of the things that I read, and we can't get into all of it, of course, but uh, I'm, I'm truly amazed at the people who did step up and let's face it there you know better than anyone how many unsung heroes there were in mm -hmm. this effort you know mm -hmm. uh, 
the guy who's going to get all the notoriety, a lot of it, deservedly so, is uh, Scott Tartar. But, you know, Costas, you, I, I think uh, your partner is, and I know you're going to be modest, but I think your partner is, is uh, uh, it, it can't be overlooked. You know? Well, I reported it, you know, but. Uh, and, and that's important. That's yeah, important. Yeah. 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 You know? Uh, but no, I, I, I take no credit, you know, cause I know a lot of people worked on it and I don't have influence particularly like, you know, Bob Costas can call Adam Silver and kind of kick him in the butt. And, uh, you know, Scott Tartar is the guy who worked with the NBA representative over and over and over again, endless conversations, that kind of thing. So, uh, and guys like Dr. J and Rick Barry certainly helped some of the guys in the hall of fame who had played in the ABA. Um, they promoted this the cause, supported it. So it, it was a group effort, but really one guy, Scott Tartar, gets about 90% of the credit for it, I think. You mentioned Rick Barry. And the, the, yeah. That's a little surprising. I didn't know that he was involved. I knew Doc was involved. Yeah. Um, but to say that Rick Barry is, was involved, that's that's pretty pretty interesting because I, I remember listening to Mr. Barry during an interview and you know, he had this reputation, you know, mm-hmm. not being such a, a nice guy. But mm-hmm. I remember watching him during an interview, and he was very aware of what people thought of him. Yeah. And he said, people are saying all these things, but they don't try and get to know me. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and so I always said, well, if I ever had the opportunity, I, I, I'll try and reach out to him. And I might still do that one day. I don't know. Yeah. You know, Rick had a certain demeanor on the court and a certain attitude that turned off opposing fans, but the guy played hard and he qualifies as a good guy. He's been, I've talked to him a few times when I was doing different projects, writing things, and he's always been very helpful to me. He, the book uh, that I wrote on the formation of the Pacer franchise, he took the trouble to email a photo to me that I used in the book. And we had some complications that took a little while and he hung in there with it. So little things like that, you know, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, Rick, in my mind, is a good guy, a good person. He just had a certain demeanor as a player that turned people off. He'd walk around with his hands on his hips, and he was always complaining about this or that, but that's not his <laughs> character. That, that's, you know, on the basketball court. So, and, a guy, and, and we mentioned Bob Nedelicki before. He deserves credit, too, because he certainly got on. He worked the phones a lot and called guys and kept them up to date, and, and you know, Nedelicki got involved in this as well. I was hoping to talk with him before I spoke with you. And I, I, I'll say this, uh, having never really been in contact with the man before, I mean, we're, you know, we're all in that same Facebook page, you know, those, those pages <laughs> devoted to the ABA. Yeah. Uh, and I may have liked a few things. He said he may have liked a few things I said, but we never really connected. But when I reached out to him by messenger today, and I told him that I was going to be talking to you. And I asked him, I said, you know, could I talk with you? He was like, sure, give me a call. And he just went ahead and, and gave me his number. Yeah. And, um, you yeah, know, but, but that's the ABA. Yeah. That's the ABA. I mean, uh, you know, there, there, there's uh, so many people and they all seem to be gracious with their time, whether they've talked to me uh or what I I tell you what I became friends with um, uh, Stan Albeck's son John, who you, you might know, and uh, I, I I mean I had never seen John in person. I never met his dad, but I knew that his dad was a phenomenal coach, mm-hmm. and uh, so uh, talked with John a few times and offering my memories of him. And meanwhile, his father, who was still a lot of the time, is in the next room. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, sadly, Stan Albeck, and again, for those of you who don't know, he was a terrific coach, uh, spent time in the a- NBA. Uh, he was Michael Jordan's first coach with the Chicago Bulls. Mm-hmm. And he also spent time uh, with the Kentucky Colonels as an assistant coach under uh, UB Brown with that phenomenal front line. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so sadly, Coach Albeck passed away, but uh, John invited me. And then not everybody got this invite. Uh, so I was very humbled that he invited me to come to the funeral. And uh, and so I did. Mm-hmm. You know? 
uh, it was it was important for me because even though I never met the man, I kind of felt like through John I got to know him a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. uh, but Coach Albeck is another one of those great ABA stories. You know, I still can in my mind's eye I can still see Coach Albeck and Coach Brown in Kentucky uh, with with the palm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I can I can still see that. You know. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, Coach Alba, he, he, had quite a, he had quite a career, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, to me, the, the, the bottom line, the best thing about the ABA was that it gave second chances to a lot of people and provided yes. opportunities for other people who would not have ever gotten into the NBA if not for that. I mean, you look at the just taking the Pacer franchise, you know, Slick Leonard is in the Hall of Fame now as a coach won three ABA championships. Well, he was selling graduation supplies and class rings an hour north of Indianapolis when the uh, ABA was formed. He had been with the Baltimore Bulls to the NBA, lost that job. He was out of basketball. He's up, you know, traveling around the high school selling graduation supplies and class rings. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ABA gave him another coaching opportunity. Various players, of course, Roger Brown is a well-known story, working in a factory in Dayton. Before, ABA gave him a chance. Um, so it just gave a lot of guys. When the ABA was formed, there were only nine eight NBA teams. So there were first-team All-Americans not making the NBA. You know, uh, that's how closed it was. It was just almost impossible to get into the NBA unless you were truly great. And the ABA opened things up and guys got opportunities and got better and better. And uh, that to me is the great contribution of the ABA to basketball. So a lot of coaches came out of the ABA. You mentioned Hubie Brown and Stan Albeck, uh, you know, Slick Leonard. Doug Moe, uh, Larry Brown. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And then a lot of players, you know, and then of course the ABA played by its own set of rules. You didn't have to be done with college. You know, you could leave college early. Yeah, uh, like Dr. J and get into the ABA. Uh, Dr. J, Spencer Haywood was another one. Yeah, you know, they expanded the opportunity for people. So uh, it was just good for basketball to have this league and the excitement, the, you know, the red, white, and blue ball. It's funny to me, the NBA certainly won't use it, but every other, you notice every other pro league uses a multicolored ball, the WNBA, the, the G League, uh, over in China. Europe, they all have a ball that's more than one color, uh, but the NBA won't do it. You know, I asked David Stern one year I covered the All-Star game. I I covered the Pacers for the Indianapolis Star for 12 years, and I was at the All-Star game one year in Houston and asked David Stern, have you guys ever considered, you know, like a red, white, and blue ball? And he just kind of laughed at me. He said, no, no, that never happens. But think how it just looks so good. You know, it it makes the – game that much more exciting and the, the shots look so good when they got the rotation on the ball yes yes and, um, now i one thing i do differ with some people a lot of people talk about how uh, the aba changed how the game was played and the nba just adopted the aba style of play but that didn't happen for a long time you know as you know when the leagues merged there was no three-point shot for there was a few no three-point shot that's right when the three-point was brought in, it was hardly used at all. A team might take 53 pointers in an entire season, you know. It wasn't until the 2000s that Steph Curry and guys came in and started, you know, lighting it up from the three-point line. So I differ with those who think yeah. that, that the NBA copied the ABA style of play, but still the ABA had great influence on basketball. Oh, no question. And, you know, you talk about – three-point shot, and you talk about Curry. I love Steph Curry, don't get me wrong, but you and I both know the NBA players today, they don't use it, they abuse it. You talked about how infrequent uh, the shot was back when they first you know, put it in the NBA. Yeah. Um, I remember, it, it, and, and this is another Hubie Brown thing. Um, boy, I'd love to get to talk to him. <laughs> Hubie Brown once said that the guy who he thinks best utilized the three-point shot was somebody who played for him, Louis Dampier. Uh Uh-huh. And, you know, I have a hard time, well, you know, who who, who am I to argue with Coach Brown anyway, but I'd be hard-pressed to find somebody who utilized it as well as he did. 
And even today, I mean, you've got, I was talking with Derek Griffin the other day about this. You know, you got drive guys driving to the basket and they can get to the bucket uncontested and they're kicking it out to, you know, to the three point line. That's horrible basketball. Yeah. You know, but uh, the ABA did give us the three point shot. It does make the game more exciting, you know, especially especially when guys are hitting the shot, when it's, when it's utilized properly, that's the key to utilize mm -hmm. it properly. So hopefully, you know, the NBA gets back to some fundamental basketball, but I did want to circle back to something you said a moment ago, you was talking about how uh, some people argue that uh, the, the ABA, you know, the NBA uh, brought ABA basketball you know, to its league. Mm -hmm. I want to circle back to that because I think there is that argument to be made uh, because before the NBA, you know, before the merger app, uh, and I read this this uh, in Terry Pluto's book, Loose Balls. Uh, somebody, I don't remember who, but someone said that the ABA was jazz improvisation. Yeah, you know, and it really was funky. Mm -hmm. Whereas the NBA was more of a symphony orchestra. Everything was structured and well orchestrated. Yeah, you know. So uh, I think there's an argument to be made there. Mm -hmm. What do you say? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The the ABA was more wide open. Uh, I and I may be biased because I know the Pacer teams weren't any good in the '80s after they got into the NBA. And they weren't playing, you know, a wide open style of play. It didn't look like an ABA game at all if you went to a game then. Now, maybe that was different, excuse me, with other teams, but the well, NBA they, they remained. They made a lot of changes after the, you know, um, before the first, their first year in the NBA. I know Billy Knight was gone. When the, uh, the, when the, the Pacers, the first, I'm saying. Yeah, the Pacers, when they first – no, Billy Knight was with the Pacers when they first got into the NBA. He was still there. And uh, I got a media guide right here. I could look it up if you want. <laughs> but no, uh, I, I, Again, you know, I'm not arguing with you either. I always thought, see, and, and I should have – if I knew I was going to bring up Billy Knight, and I should have known because I love Billy Knight, but uh, I thought that he was involved in a three-way trade with the Knicks. He went to the Knicks, and then from the Knicks went to – I want to say Kansas City. Nah. Well, he played, I think, maybe at the end of his career for Kansas City. He played in Boston. He played in Buffalo. Uh, but the, the first Pacers NBA team, 76-77, uh, well, you know what? Yeah, Billy Knight was their leading scorer, averaged 26 a game. Is that right? And okay. Danny Roundfield, right. Dave Roby, Starnell Hillman remained with the NBA Pacers, Don Boozy. Freddie Lewis played a little bit. Super John Williamson was with him for 30 games, you know. So uh, the first Pacer NBA team won 36 games. They weren't too bad. But uh, uh, but Billy Knight was with him for a while. Then he got traded away. Then he came back later on. He did go back. Yeah, and Williamson went back to the Nets, too. The Pacers, yeah, yeah it was weird. The, the, you know, Slick Leonard, as good a coach as he was, didn't do a great job all the time with his personnel moves, making trades and so forth. And he basically gave Super John away. You know, Slick didn't like things to be too wide open. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he didn't get much in return for Super John. But uh, he, in fact, he traded Darnell Hillman for Super John, I believe. But then he only kept. Because yeah, Hillman John. went to the Mets. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, but. Yeah, Super John, he was an exciting player, but he wasn't Slick's kind of player, so he was only a pacer for about 30 games. Wow. But, yeah. So, you know, I, I wanted this to be, you know, again, going back to my childhood, I wanted this to be somewhat of a celebration, you know, of, you know, what took place with this uh, recognition payment mm -hmm. for the former players. Um uh, you you have helped make the celebration tonight, and uh, you know I hope that guys like Bert Averitt and Goo Kennedy and you know uh, George Carter, I hope they're smiling somewhere up there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, thank thank you again for your time. But before we go, 
I do want to mention that you have a book out now. And I want you yeah. to please hold it up and give us the plug. Okay. No yeah. Shit, and self promotion here. In 2017, I came out with this book called Reborn. And I, can you see it okay? Yes. And, uh, it's It covers the formation of the Pacer franchise in the first two seasons when they got off the ground. And uh, all the fortunate things that had to happen for the Pacers to just survive. I mean, they were so lucky at the beginning, getting Roger Brown out of a factory, getting Slick Leonard out of a job up in Kokomo, Indiana, a sales job. Uh, Freddie Lewis, you know, was the third string point guard in Cincinnati. They, they got him. Uh, they got Mel Daniels in a steal of a trade because the Minnesota franchise was moving and they needed cash. The Minnesota Muskies. Yeah, they moved to Miami. I, I think they were the Muskies then. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. That 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 was before the Pittsburgh team moved to Minnesota. So the Minnesota Muskies moved to Miami, and they needed cash right away. And they traded Mel Daniels to the Pacers for a hundred thousand dollars. And um, so the Pacers had so many fortunate things happen to just survive those first few years. And they added George McGinnis, you know, they added other guys. And uh, in Indianapolis, I mean. You would have had to have been here, but the Pacers were a big deal. They really kind of united the city. I thought they had a really positive impact on race relations. Uh, it was the one place oh. where they had, it was the one place where blacks and whites could come together for the same event. And the players were so popular. You know, Mel Daniels, George uh, McGinnis, and Darnell Hillman and Freddie Lewis, you know, were so popular. They were out of the community, and they really, I think, educated a lot of people. Ned Mickey was pretty popular too, wasn't he? Oh, he was. He, he absolutely was. And he was kind of, they called him the Joe Namath of the Indiana Pacers. Playboy, he opened <laughs> the bar. You know, and, That's and, perfect. And, and Neto and Mel were really close. Neto and Mel were really tight. And Pacers, when they won championships, used to have this banquet, like a ham and beans dinner out at the fairgrounds. And fans could go for five bucks to this celebration banquet dinner for the championship team. And it was televised and Mel and Neto would always, they'd get up there together. So and joke around. And I just think it had a lot to do with educating some people about, yeah, you know, black and white can get along pretty well. They, they really made that impact. And then because they were successful, it got a downtown arena built. And that sparked downtown development. Downtown was dead, you know, in the late 60s. But when they started building that arena, it got things going downtown. Uh, so uh, the Pacers really had a huge impact on the city beyond just the basketball games. And I think they still do, too. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. Without question. I mean, yeah. you know, you, you've had a lot of terrific talent come through, you know, to wear the Indiana Pacer uniform, you know, not just Reggie Miller, you know, there were some other guys, Rick Smith, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, the Davis boys. Yeah. You know, I mean, talk, talk about talented guys. And while I don't know them personally, you probably do. Um, mm -hmm. I get the feeling that they're right up there along with the old Pacers, you know, in terms of popularity and, and what they have done for the community. Am I wrong? Uh, no, 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 no. They, uh, you know, they, they, they didn't win a championship. So, you know, it's funny. I covered those teams for the newspaper here locally. And I remember fans always complaining about them, you know, when they, they'd get to the conference finals and one time they got to the finals in 2000. Uh, so people were happy about that, but they're, you know how it is. The sports fans are always unhappy with this or that and complaining. What have you done for me lately? <laughs> and now as they look, people are nostalgic about those teams now. You know, the Davis brothers and obviously Reggie is always going to be huge here and other players as well. Jalen Rose. Uh, it's funny how many ex-Pacers are on television here and there doing things. And um, so they're, they're finally remembered. And it's human nature, I think, when you look back on something to filter out the negative memories and look and think of the highlights and you have a good feeling about it. So, you know, hey, Back in the ABA, the fans often booed the Pacers. They booed. <laughs> they did, man. It was harsh. It was a harsh environment. They'd throw things on the floor if they had oh, a, no. to complain about a referee's call. Um, referee. Did they think that they were in Philadelphia or what? <laughs> I know. Oh, it was it's really 
people don't realize what the environment was like at those some of those ABA games. I mean, they would hang a referee in effigy, you know, oh, no. <laughs> that kind of thing. There was a game where a couple fans attacked a referee afterward. Again, fans would throw something on the court to protest the call. Oh, uh, so, and then again, if a player wasn't performing well, you might get booed. Uh, but overall, the memories are very positive about those days. <laughs> oh my goodness! I, yeah, I see that. That's well. I mean, the booing and everything. You know, everybody gets booed. You know, but uh, you know, somehow it sounds like it was just a little bit more uh, extreme. Put it that way. And it, it was just kind of the times, you know, the late 60s with the Vietnam War going on and everything, the assassinations, the whole country. Yeah, the 60s. Actually, you know, it's funny, the, the first year of the Pacers, it was just a love fest. Oh, we're so happy to have a team. We love you guys. You know, the second year, it changed just like that. And you think about it, you know, 67 was the summer of love. 68, we had assassinations, you know, Dr. King and others and the whole mood was different yeah king and, uh, and rfk yeah. robert f kennedy in 68 like jimmy rail who's a local guy played at indiana university he was voted the team's most popular player the first year of the franchise he got booed the second year <laughs> wow. and, you know wow. it, it was harsh man and i that's the kind of thing i covered in the book just how dramatically things changed but then that second year, they, they, they Slick came in and they had a playoff run, and that's when the city fell in love with the team. But it was not that easy, and it didn't happen instantaneously, too. They had to do some things first. You know, you just <laughs> – you brought up uh, some of the social unrest mm -hmm. back, you know, in 67, 68. And that kind of paralleled with – uh, the beginning of the ABA and, you know, into the early seventies. I mean, there were some angry people and, you know, uh, you know, not to put race into this, but let's face it. There was, there was, uh, I, I think the ABA came at just the perfect time because I know for a large number of black people, it was all about self-expression and certainly the ABA allowed that. So yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. Dr. J was, you know, was the epitome of self-expression. Yeah. You know, yeah. Connie he, Hawkins, you know, brought the, the was an open, Yeah, absolutely. Before Doc. Yeah. And, you, yeah. you know, like Darnell Hillman is still hugely popular around here for two reasons. He was a great jumper. He dunked it and he had a huge afro. And, you yeah. know, people remember that afro, you know, and he was hugely popular just because he had flair. And that's was reflective of the time. Well, that, that was the entire ABA. I mean, you know, Doc and Hillman had the big froze. Mike Gale, well, his fro was a notch or two <laughs> below. Yeah. I, I think I, I had I had more, more of an afro than Mike Gale, actually. <laughs> Mike, if you ever watched this, not putting you down, man, you had a great fro. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, there were a few great froze out there. You know, mm -hmm. Doc and Hillman, though, they were at the top of that list. Artist Gilmore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he had, he, had, he had the length, you know, he had the growth. Uh, but like I said, Doc and Hillman were, you know, high and way above everybody else in that regard. Yeah. But listen, yeah. Uh, we've been in for almost an hour. I, I promised myself I was going to keep this to half an hour. But, you know, you just can't get through topics involving the ABA in 30 minutes. It's impossible. No, no. no I've never done a 30-minute podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do want to thank you for your time. It, it, you know, it's been a great pleasure meeting you, finally. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, one day maybe we'll get a chance to do this again. Maybe we'll do a follow-up and, uh, you know, you could tell me how some of those players, those remaining players uh, from the ABA, how they're doing, how they're faring. Sure. You know, yeah. I, I, was really Mount, I was on the phone with Rick Mount. I was on the phone with Rick Mount yesterday. I got a text from Billy Keller today. I had lunch with George McGinnis last week, you know, so because I'm researching another book, so I stay in touch. Right. I remember you saying that. Yeah. So, yeah, I at least the Pacer guys. And I I talked to Daryl Carrier on the phone a few months ago. I've talked to Randy Mahaffey and 
you know, it's fun to talk to these guys and uh, they all got stories and um, I'm always up for that. So, yeah. I'd like to be a fly on wall for when all you guys get together. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's fun. And, uh, uh, you, you know, it's just always interesting to me to be around former athletes, guys who once were on top of the world. Now they're just like you and me, basically. Uh, they may be well remembered. They may be recognized occasionally, but they're just living a regular life. And it's not an easy adjustment for those guys to make. And uh, it usually takes some time. You know, George McGinnis talks about that. You know, one day you're recognized every time you go out. And, you know, now nobody recognizes him when he goes to the grocery store. So um, well, he's doing, he's still doing TV for the Pacers at all. Uh, George? Yeah. No, no, he did a little bit when he, he moved away. He got cut by the Pacers in the fall of 82. He w- moved to Denver for a few years. He came back in 85 and did some TV. But he got into other things, too. And then he started his own business that did really well later. So he doesn't do anything now. Uh, Darnell Hillman retired a couple of years ago from the front office. He was community relations and did an outstanding job. Uh, but um, no, no. Uh, he was involved in this project, too, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He I did a thing. You know, Darnell Hillman in 1977 won the NBA slam dunk contest. It was not sponsored by the league. It was sponsored by CBS. And Darnell, at halftime of the final NBA playoff game of the year, won the slam dunk contest. And he wore a softball jersey that he had had when he was in Indianapolis playing a softball league with Pacer front office and some other players, sponsored by the Bottle Shop. A good friend of mine owns the Bottle Shop now, still in business. So Darnell, here he is talking to Don Crickey after winning the slam dunk contest, putting on a Bottle Shop softball jersey so we've recreated that and uh, sold it and uh, we've had a couple of uh, events at the bottle shop where fans can come and buy a bottle shop jersey and meet darnell and and scott tarter is selling the aba ball now for his company yes we've had a couple of events and darnell donates his time very generously to the dropping dimes cause he takes nothing from it himself so uh, Darnell's an outstanding guy. He's an interesting guy. He went from the Army to the Pacers and grew that afro, and he was in a whole different world. He had just a different to, world, absolutely. Yeah, he had been in the Army for two years, you know, and so he uh, he's, an, he's an interesting guy in his own right. Well, hopefully one day I get a chance to talk to some of the former Pacer players. I think that would be a blast, too. Yeah. But listen, I want to thank you for your time. It's, it's sure. speaking of a blast. It's been a blast for me. I appreciate you coming on with me. Uh, we'll do this again sometime real soon. I hope. Okay. Yeah. Feel free anytime. Be glad to come on with you. All right. So, folks, uh, there you have it. Uh, Mark Monteith. Uh, by all means, remember to go pick up his book if you haven't picked it up already. It's been out a couple of years, but the name is Rebound. Reborn. Reborn. I'm sorry. Reborn. Reborn yeah. Did I Reborn. Say Reborn. Yeah. No, the Rebound is another book. Pro Basketball to Indianapolis, yeah. Reborn. <laughs> <laughs> Reborn. Rebound is another book about Earl Manigo. That's but, right. Uh, that's right. But I called it Reborn because that's what the ABA did. You know, they, the careers were reborn, you know, because of the ABA. Absolutely. Okay, so thank you again for your time, Mark. Uh, and for those of you uh, watching this, thank you all for tuning in. This is Matt Claire saying be blessed. Remember to do something nice for somebody. And we'll see you again next time.